Hi, everyone. My name is Theo. I'm one of the first years here, uh, and I'll be presenting the first case of Gs Rounds today. So we have a 47-year-old man who presents for a second opinion of four weeks of progressive painless uh, left eye fullness. If anyone from plastics, I think Dr. Penny uh, would like to comment on the external photo here. I don't know if anyone else is here. So, I, yeah, I mean, I can comment. This is my case, just uh, but since there's no one else here. So he came in. You see fullness, proptosis of the, the uh, left eye. Um, you know, a little fuller superiorly, but, um, and, um, yeah, I think that's, that's yeah. it. So on initial examination, his uh, exam was notable for seeing 20-20 out of that left eye, uh, normal pressures, no APD. His confrontational visual fields were full. He had five millimeters of proptosis on that left side um, and restricted uh, adduction and choroidal folds on his uh, DFE. So his past medical history was notable for what he said was a self-diagnosis of low testosterone. Uh, he did not have a past ocular history, uh, no constitutional symptoms, no recent illnesses, and no headaches, uh, non-contributory family history, allergy to penicillin, and he took an over-the-counter testosterone supplementation. There was no relevant social history. Um, so Dr. Penny, could you talk through sort of what you're thinking at this point in this case? So, you know, if it's really four weeks of um, proptosis versus noticed four weeks ago, which is always kind of the thing that you have to think about. I mean, obviously, unilateral proptosis in a, an adult the thyroid is the most common thing. He didn't have any lid retraction, so I think that would um, make that less, uh, less likely, but not impossible. Um, you know, and then you start to think about um, inflammatory things, well, he didn't really look inflamed. Um, it didn't look uh, like something that was infectious. Um, and then uh, you can think of masses, uh, anywhere from uh, benign uh, things uh, uh, to uh, something malignant. Now, the thing that's a little different here is you said he has choroidal folds. And, and um, for that amount of proptosis, which didn't, it was, it was notable, but not huge, um, you know, it's a little bit unusual for you to see um, choroidal folds unless you know there's something growing that's aggressive pushing the eye uh, from behind um, so I mean you start to think you know malignant could it be um, I mean metastatic could it be just a, a primary malignancy I mean I think we have to see where it is on imaging uh, to get a better better idea Bob do you ever see choroidal folds in thyroid disease uh, yes you do rarely but you definitely do but again just looking at this, I mean, I didn't see his motility, or his motility was pretty full. Um, I mean, just a little bit, it, it, yeah. usually you have a pretty inflamed tight orbit to, to see choroidal folds. Yeah, you can see choroidal folds with tumors that are right up against the back of the eye. When it flattens the back of the eye, then you're gonna see choroidal folds. Yeah, if I mean, there's a, a mass way deep in the orbit, you might not see it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've even seen it with benign, like cavernous hemangiomas, but I think more of, you know, something uh, that's, that's a little more aggressively growing. So at the time of presentation, the patient had had a MRI and a CT done uh, outside provider. So first we'll look at the differential diagnosis at the time. I think we've touched on uh, everything here, categorizing it as inflammatory, neoplastic, or vascular. Uh, the, here's an image from the MRI. Dr. Penny, do you care to comment? So you can see this sort of not so well defined mass, and then it has you know different kind of loculated areas. Some um, you know a little bit lighting up, others uh, more less so. So multiple different kind of little compartments in, in that area. Almost looks like a. Uh, can you come, please? <laughs> That's what I get for showing up early. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's a multi-loculated mass in there. It almost looks like there's some fluid levels in there, which are a little weird because they look like they're anti-gravity. Here, this part, this looks like a cystic cavity in here. It almost looks like this dark band in here is a fluid level, although I need to see it on different views. But, you know, patients laying on their back, it doesn't make sense that you get a fluid level, you know, that defies gravity necessarily, but it looks like portions of this are hemorrhagic because they're very dark inside or they contain a whole lot of protein inside of there. 
but it's a complex mass. It's certainly not uh, all solid. And one more image here. And this would kind of confirm this is a contrast enhanced CT. And there's some cystic cavities inside of here. Some of these I can't tell. It depends if there was a pre-contrast. This almost looks like it's a calcification intrinsically. Uh, and then there's some areas in the more solid appearing mass that are enhancing. Yeah, so this is read as a large left orbital mass that was primarily intraconal uh, with a little bit of extraconal extension. And the radiologist uh, confirmed that it was, or said that it suggested a concern for a benign slow flow venous lesion. Uh, so our differential at this point, um, do, we've sort of taken some things off of it. Dr. Penny, do you want to comment on, or comment on where this takes us? Sure. Well, I mean, the concern, I think, is, is this a vascular mass, as you as you said, uh, some sort of uh, either uh, varix type thing, uh, or could this be some other uh, growth malignant? Uh, I don't really know. It doesn't look like a cavernous hemangioma. Um, so I think you know ultimately we need to think about how we're going to either remove this or biopsy this. Um, but then also, if this is vascular, um, you know, do we have to be concerned about bleeding? Sure, it's in the lacrimal, gla lacrimal gland fossa, so you always have to keep in mind malignancies of the lacrimal gland. And when you see calcium, you can see calcium in low flow lesions. They're called phleboliths. And you can see calcification in lacrimal gland tumors, too. So we still haven't ruled out a malignancy. Can I just ask my colleagues that know more about this, um, what about an echinococcal cyst? How would that be differentiated? <laughs> I guess that was directed to me. Well, I'd have to plead ignorance to that because I've never seen one, not even in a book. So, I, and I think the, I mean, so some of the other things we talked about, obviously things like thyroid, um, inflammatory. I mean, we're, we've kind of eliminated this to. You know, something either a uh, lacrimal gland, malignant, um, benign, vascular type uh, lesion, I think is what we're thinking. Yeah, and so exactly as we've sort of discussed, some neoplastic uh, still there on the differential, but also concern for a vascular lesion. Um, so, um, thoughts on the next step? Uh, may I ask a question, Dr. Shields? Um, lymphoproliferative lesions uh, in the orbit, do they induce choroidal folds? Just you know, for education yeah. purposes. If they're directly behind the globe and flattening the back of the globe, they can. Most lymphoid tumors are pretty much anterior in the orbit, and they are generally extraconal. They can be interconal, and they don't produce choroidal folds. And, and we always kind of think that they, as you said, mold. You, Carol, do you think that the more aggressive, the more sort of, shall we say, malignant something is, the more chance it would cr create Coroidal folds if it's sitting against the eye, is that? Possibly, possibly. The other thing on your CT scan, <clears throat> it looked like the bone was kind of molded around this, su more suggestive of chronicity, rather than eaten away, which would suggest malignancy. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Penny, thoughts on next steps in management of this patient? Um, at this point in the case? Yeah, so we, we were really thinking that this was some sort of vascular lesion that's, you know, in reviewing the imaging and such. So, and we were concerned, or I was concerned that I was going to get in there and, you know, have bleeding I couldn't control. So we decided to have uh, them see uh, neurosurgery to try to do something to close off any vascular uh, channels uh, first. Perfect. So the patient was initially evaluated uh, by neurosurgery telemedically. He then followed up for a diagnostic cerebral angiogram, which characterized it as not being a high flow vascular lesion. So the plan was then made for a stage direct puncture onyx embolization, followed by the next day an orbitotomy. Our following exam for the patient, this is after the embolization, but prior to the orbitotomy, decreased vision in the left eye to 2070, slightly increased pressure, pupils unchanged, and the motility further restricted after this embolization. So direct puncture means they go right into it rather than feeding it up through a tributary vessel? That's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, he looked and there was no feeder vessel of any kind to do that. And, um, you know, their thought is with onyx is that, you know, you, you inject this into these vascular channels, it hardens, 
becomes a hard mass that is then relatively avascular, and then you can just remove it and it doesn't bleed. And which onyx is, the theory. is it like a super gluey type thing? Yeah, um, I believe Bob, that's what they use for. Do they use onyx for aneurysms? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they uh, use it to sclerose vessels um, in various tumors and in vascular lesions. So the patient then went for the left orbitotomy. At the time, the lesion was found to be multiloculated with pockets of white cloudy fluid, white toothpaste-like material, did not appear to be vascular. It was very adherent to the lateral rectus, the optic nerve, and the globe. It was impossible to resect completely, but partial resection was completed and biopsy. Dr. Melvin, could you speak to some of these? So, you know, just, just a comment for a second. You know, we got in there, and yeah, this was this mass that it almost looked like a dermoid that had been excised and not incompletely excised and recurred because it was just stuck to everything. It was multiloculated. There were some pockets that were just almost liquid-like, kind of cloudy liquid, and others that were more toothpaste-like, um, but, and, and was stuck to the globe, stuck to, you know, so we couldn't totally resect this. Uh. Yeah, so here, this black stuff, that's annex, and um, you see degenerated debris in the background. And here you see uh, pretty densely fibrotic tissue with fossa of calcification and some onyx material. And uh, in the background of this extensive fibrosis and onyx, um, there were uh, duct-type structures um, infiltrating the tissue and forming large spaces with calcification. So in higher magnification here, you see uh, a duct lined by what's called cribriform lining, where the cells forming structures reminiscent of Roman arches. And in the center, you have comedian necrosis and calcification. You also have more infiltrative tumor as well in the background of fibrosis. On higher magnification, you can see that these neoplastic cells have pleomorphic nuclei. So there is some moderate to high grade atypia here. And on higher magnification, uh, you can actually see mitotic figures and more prominent nuclear atypia. So this is a high grade neoplasm that's forming duct-like structures. And it's analogous to a ductal carcinoma of the breast. It also produces mucin, which is highlighted with Alshin blue stain. And in uh, immunohistochemistry, it's immunoreactive for cytokeratin 7, which is carcinoma above diagram, diaphragm, compatible with lacrimal gland and breast cancer. Um, it's also immunoreactive for GATA3, which you can also see in lacrimal gland and breast cancer. It also expresses mammoglobin, which is a breast carcinoma marker. And it stains for androgen receptors, which is a profile for ductal carcinoma of salivary gland and lacrimal gland. At the request of uh, Dr. Johnson, the uh, oncologist at Jefferson, we also obtained HER2 new uh, because these cancers can overexpress HER2 new similar to uh, breast carcinoma, and there is 3 plus overexpression of HER2 new in a membranous pattern. So uh, given the location of this lesion, and as um, Dr. Schultz and Dr. Penny commented on uh, potential chronicity of the processes, process with remodeling of the lacrimal gland fossa, uh, ductal adenocarcinoma of lacrimal gland is a um, diagnostic consideration because we did not see an in situ component in resection. Metastasis cannot be entirely excluded, and a systemic work needs to be performed. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. So just to touch on adenocarcinoma of the lacrimal gland, this is a very rare malignancy that was first reported in 1999. There's a four to one male to female predominance and the median age of diagnosis is 64. It's extremely similar to salivary gland uh, carcinoma as Dr. Melvin alluded to. And salivary gland carcinoma is more common, has a more robust literature base, and thus a lot of our decisions in the management for patients with lacrimal duct adenocarcinoma are based on the literature of salivary duct carcinoma. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for coming. This is Dr. Johnson, uh, the patient's primary oncologist from Jefferson. So with this patient getting this pathologic diagnosis, what, what are your next steps and sort of what are you thinking for that? 
So the first thing that I was thinking was that we need that systemic workup. I, I would like to find out very much whether or not this is coming from somewhere else in the patient's body. And my first request was for a PET CT scan. I wanted to look distantly to see if there is any other source, but I also wanted to characterize the draining lymph nodes to see whether or not we had any movement of this outside of the lacrimal gland. So that was part of my first priority. And then the next, you've already touched upon it a bit, was to characterize the disease more fully by doing further immunohistochemistry for things like HER2, which are targetable, including next-gen sequencing to look for other targetable uh, alterations. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and would you also comment on the patient um, had with his testosterone supplementation that he had sort of self-started? So, we had a talk about that. <laughs> Um, for this particular patient, and borrowing, again, from the salivary gland literature, androgen deprivation therapy for AR overexpressing tumors is a viable treatment option for him. So I also asked him absolutely to stop the testosterone supplementation, that that could have been feeding this tumor, that one of the treatment options that could be available to us in the future would be to reverse the testosterone by giving him androgen deprivation. Thank you. So the patient then, over the next couple weeks, um, he had tested positive for COVID, which delayed his further imaging. There was a plan for a PET CT, but insurance company difficulties did not allow that to happen. So a couple months later, got a CT chest, which showed multiple pulmonary emboli. He was started on Xarelto. This delayed his being taken to ENT for a sentinel node biopsy, which he eventually was, um, and that was negative. And then he was referred to radiation oncology to discuss adjuvant radiation to the surgical bed. That was the plan initially, um, but repeat MRI before treatment because it had been many months since his uh, surgery and MRI initially. Um, we have images here. Dr. Penny, would you care to comment on? Or, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, can I just ask that, uh, that the same question that question uh, just before uh, imaging. So um, in a previously surgically uh, treated bed, would you be able to comment on success of sentinel lymph node biopsy? I, I just don't have much experience with this type of scenario. Do you mean you well, so, so there was already prior surgery. It probably modified you know, some of the vasculature and uh, drainage, and then you inject a material to look for sentinel lymph node, how reliable would that be? Yeah, I don't think, I don't know that I can comment on that. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure. We do that all the time after removing conjunctival tumors. And in the literature, you know, they, they like you to do your injection uh, before you remove the tumor because you disturb all of the normal lymphatic drainage. But, uh, who wants to sit there and get an injection of a medication? Every patient wants to have the tumor removed promptly and then secondarily have the injection. So we hope we're, we're not disturbing the lymphatic drainage too much, uh, especially with conjunctival tumors, when we do sentinel lymph node biopsy. Well, this is a coronal T2-weighted image right through the, the globe, and it looks like we have recurrent mass here on the, le on the left side, and it's, the matrix is low in signal on the T2-weighted images, which implies it has cellular characteristics, so uh, based on this one image alone, I'd be worried there's, there's tumors still there, and or one, it'll come back. One more image. Uh, hmm. I don't know if this is as good as your last it's image. hard to scroll through. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, but I don't know if they're still in the, over in the lacrimal fossa, if they're still... Uh, some dark material over here, you know, superlaterally, just like we saw in the coronal. You know, and I can say I took, I mean, I thought I fairly well debulked this without, but, you know, one, you always think you've removed more than you did, but this is how many, is a couple months after? Couple months. Handful. So certainly I think it's, you know, there's more there than I left there when we got done, so. So due to this sort of exactly as you touched on, Dr. Penny, some component of residual but likely re recurrent as well. Um, the patient un elected to undergo orbital exenteration. The exenteration was carried out without difficulty, uh, and all margins were free from tumor cell. So the patient uh, was referred to radiation oncology and began plans for radiation to the surgical bed. So I'll touch on this in a moment, but Dr. Johnson, uh, these patients who come and don't have any evidence of metastatic disease, 
uh, lacrimal ductal adenocarcinoma does have a risk of eventual metastases developing. What are your thoughts on surveillance for this patient going forward now that he's currently no diagnosis of metastatic disease and undergoing radiation? He also had a few other complications in the middle of all of this. So he had his COVID diagnosis. So he also already had abnormal chest radiography that needs a follow-up. Beyond that, however, um, my thoughts in general are to surveil them for local recurrence and distant recurrence, both. And these need to be done over a longer period of time than one might think for other types of tumors, for salivary gland malignancies. There's a wide variety of doubling times for salivary gland, and if you think about some of the less aggressive forms, not a salivary ductal, but something that might be more like an adenoid cystic, you can have distant metastatic disease show up 15 years after their initial treatment. And so and the most likely location for that is the lung. So his surveillance is going to require MRI or look around the orbit, and then it's also going to require CT chest. Do I have any strict guidelines on how frequently that should happen? No. What do I do? <laughs> every three months for the first year, every four months for the second year, every six months up until year five, and then we do an annual high five. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Johnson. So in summary, this is a 47-year-old man who came with progressive painless left eye fullness. And the image was initially quite suggestive of uh, that was the potential of a vascular lesion, but he was diagnosed with ductal adenocarcinoma of the lacrimal gland, which is a rare malignancy, and we uh, developed much of our treatment and management protocols from other literature just out of necessity. He's now status post exenteration and undergoing adjuvant radiotherapy. So our pathology and oncology group actually uh, reported one of the earliest cases of lacrimal gland ductal adenocarcinoma. And the neoplasm subsequently has been characterized largely in just case reports and literature reviews, as we've alluded to. Um, it's extremely rare, and it's very similar to salivary duct carcinoma, as we've touched on. So that's the literature that really contributes to the management of these patients. But the care or the mainstay of treatment is really staging and local resection, followed by radiotherapy if necessary. Um, and as we've sort of alluded to, presentation with metastatic disease is uncommon. Uh, one literature review found that 5% of patients present with metastatic disease. But eventually, those in that same cohort, 58% develop distant metastasis, with the lung being the most common site. Furthermore, an additional review found that 50% uh, of patients who did not present with metastatic disease did eventually develop it during the follow-up course, and 41% of those patients died of their illness. As we've touched on a little bit, um, like salivary gland carcinoma and ductal carcinoma of the breast, lacrimal ductal adenocarcinoma frequently has an amplification of HER2, which is a part of oncogene. And trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets this amplification. Um, so far, while there are research being done, um, there's not sufficient data to recommend this. But while it works uh, to increase life expectancy for folks with uh, breast ductal carcinoma, um, it does not, has not shown a significant effect on HER2 positive salivary ductal carcinomas at this time. And then finally to another point that Dr. Johnson has already touched on, um, this is a phase two study that was published in 2018 that suggests that androgen deprivation therapy is a viable option for treatment of these malignancies of the salivary gland carcinoma variety, but this has been extrapolated to the lacrimal gland as well and might play a role in our patient's future if he uh, develops metastatic disease. So I'd like to thank Dr. Penny, Dr. Millman, and Dr. Johnson for all their help with the presentation, all of my co-residents for their help with the presentation, and everyone who contributed today. And here are my references. Take it. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> Should have worn heels. All right. Good morning. My name is Sarah Emanuel. I'm one of the second year residents. I'll be presenting today's second case. This is a 20 year old female who was referred to the Wills ER with one week of blurry vision and pain with movement of the left eye. Past medical history is significant for asthma. She had no surgical or ocular history. She takes an oral contraceptive, PRN, ibuprofen. Social history is insignificant. She has no pertinent family history. Her review of systems is um, pertinent for a headache, one week preceding her blurry vision and eye pain. 
Otherwise, she had no fevers, chills, no abdominal symptoms, no other neurologic symptoms. Initial exam revealed 20-20 vision in both eyes. Her right eye was briskly reactive. Her left pupil was sluggish with a one plus relative afferent pupillary defect. Pressures were normal in both eyes. Confrontation visual fields were full to counting fingers. Her motility was full, but noted to be painful. Her color plates were also full, but she did note an 80% red desaturation of the left eye. Her slit lamp exam of the anterior segment was normal. So then we look to the posterior segment. Dr. Sergat, what did we see here when we looked at her nerve? So we have a, uh, a multicolor <clears throat> OCT. Uh, this, these are the uh, composite images. Uh, the right nerve is normal. This is a normal reflectance off the internal limiting membrane. And here you can see she has marked uh, disc edema. And there's some vascular changes here uh, that may be secondary to this optic disc congestion. Uh, this is how multicolor works. This is what we see with our ophthalmoscopes. This is white light. This has a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. Here we're actually doing tomograms uh, with light. Blue light, uh, uh, the wavelength here is about 486. Green, 518. And infrared, longer, uh, around 815 or so. And so now we're going to get images in very precise areas through the retina, uh, right where the blood vessels are located, all the way down here. Uh, so it's uh, a much better image than what we see traditionally here uh, with the uh, uh, white light ophthalmoscopy. Here are the patient's reflectance images. From so the th these are normal. This is uh, infrared, deep retina, an optic nerve, uh, green and blue. And here you can see the edema actually stand, extends into the deep retina and also is full thickness uh, through uh, the entire area. Thank you. So at this point, we have a 20-year-old woman with an APD and pain with eye movement. Uh, Dr. Thornton, if we called you from the ER, what would your uh, next step be? would recommend an MRI of the brain in orbits. That's exactly what um, the patient underwent. Dr. Flanders, could you walk us through these cuts? Certainly. So this is an axial T1 weighted image of uh, a lot of the brain and, of course, the orbits, post contrast with fat suppression. And, of course, we draw your attention to the left orbit. Um, there is a lot of enhancement going on involving uh, the entire, almost pretty much the entire length of the optic nerve, the intraorbital portion of the optic nerve extending into the optic canal. Um, in fact, if anything, it almost looks like the enhancement extends beyond the dural envelope and into the retrobulbar fat. You can see all this kind of reticulation around here that you don't see to the same degree in the right orbit. These are coronal T1 weighted images with contrast and fat suppression showing uh, here on the image on the right, you can see kind of the same thing where you see this kind of perineuritic component enhancing around and that it's extending into the intraorbital fat. And then you go a little further forward in the orbit and you can see the enhancement really involves the optic nerve as well. So we have uh, optic nerve involvement, and we have dural involvement, and we have perineuritic involvement. The image on the left is another post contrast T1 image showing this. We're getting very close here to the optic canal, and the enhancement is extending into the canal itself. And then the image on the right is a T2 weighted image, just showing that there is um, pretty clear edema involving the intraorbital portion of the optic nerve. Uh, this is a flare image on the right, just showing that there's no demyelinating lesions in the brain, and there's really no, uh, well, there's no diffusion problems as far as you can tell, but there is kind of what looks like restricted diffusivity, the whole length of the optic nerve from the optic nerve head running pretty close to the optic canal. Adam, is that true on the other side too? <clears throat> oh, that I can see the nerve itself? No. 
effusivity you mentioned? Uh, you mean uh, involving the right optic nerve? Well, I think you can see this commonly. It's just this look. This kind of stood out as being uh, as being more extensive than it is on the right side. Okay. But you can see the optic nerve commonly if we catch it just in the right plane on a DWI image. And what does that tell you? Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell you much because the restriction, you know, because since all of the axons are running perpendicular, you know, to the plane of the image itself, it may just mean that we're looking at white matter, you know, compact white matter. But it doesn't, what does it tell us about the left nerve or the right nerve? Uh, the right nerve. Well, it's, it is known that active demyelination in the brain can cause restricted diffusion you know, on M active MS lesions. Not all, all the time, but sometimes you can actually see restricted diffusion. So I just thought it was kind of interesting if this was active demyelination in the, la in, in the nerve itself that you could see it, and that's been reported before on diffusion-weighted images of the brain. Thank you, Dr. Flanders. So in summary, at this point, we have a 20-year-old female. She has new onset blurred vision. Her exam reveals unilateral disc edema without any vitreous inflammation. MRI findings included optic nerve enhancement. Dr. Thornton, at this point in your clinical decision making, what are you thinking in terms of next steps? Where is the disease process here? And in terms of inpatient versus outpatient management, what are you thinking? So in this one year old girl with optic nerve enhancement and perineural enhancement as well, um, thinking about um, some atypical forms of optic neuritis, including anti-mob, so I would want to get that lab test in the emergency room. We could also get NMO and some of the other labs we get for atypical causes of optic neuritis, like syphilis, Lyme, TB, et cetera. Um, and then when there's perineural enhancement, we sometimes also get IgG4 and ANCA. And I think because of the presence of the enhancement here, we would be planning to admit this patient and pulse her with IV steroids. Uh, Adam, can this be NMO? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I guess some people might wonder if it was NMO only because how extensive the lesion is involving the whole length of the nerve. That usually is, uh, gets people a little more excited. The perineuritic component is a little unusual, though. And uh, that's, the, that's the part that seems to be in the literature. They differentiate that. With, you can see that more commonly with MOG than you can with NMO or with just plain old optic neuritis. But, uh, so it's more commonly, but it, it's... Not definitive. Yeah, nothing's definitive. I mean, I, I, I took the liberty of looking at uh, a nice summary from last year in seminars that, of ophthalmology that actually kind of showed the, the tremendous variation in the literature about, you know, the proportion of these findings that you could see in those three groups. But they said the propensity of this stuff. Well, one thing that stood out is that perineuritic, a perineuritic involvement and optic nerve involvement was clearly more common in MOG than the other two entities. That was one of the few things that seemed to stand out more than anything else. The length of the lesion obviously is more common in MOG and NMO, but something like that where you have a, something that involves pretty much the whole length of the nerve. So, you know, more and more this is not just optic neuritis and bam, we go right to the diagnosis of could this be remitting relapsing multiple sclerosis, or what's called clinically isolated syndromes. And uh, from a very, very practical and important standpoint, we're approaching these cases as it's neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder until proven otherwise, which is a, a arteritis, a vasculitis. Uh, and in MS, the inflammatory cells come out of the veins. It's a perivenular extravasation of lymphocytes. Uh, so the prognosis for NMO is uh, only one-third of patients with NMO recover good vision. Um, so it's, that's a curve we have to change. Uh, so at this point, it's fairly late at night in the ER, and the contingency plan from our neuro-ophthalmology on-call was that if there's unilateral enhancement, the patient was to follow up directly in clinic in the morning, and if there's bilateral enhancement or brain lesions, the patient would be directly admitted. Um, as we saw, there was unilateral enhancement, so the patient went to clinic the next day. Um, we already discussed these tests. Um, I'll also circle back and ask Dr. Thornton, do you think a lumbar puncture should be done in the Wills ER? Uh, 
I wouldn't do a lumbar puncture at this point. If I was concerned for an infectious process, I might consider doing that, but um, not yet. There's no emergency here to do a lumbar puncture. Uh, and then who's going to take responsibility uh, for the post-lumbar puncture headache or any other post-LP complications? Uh, so I don't s sense a great urgency mm -hmm. that this is going to change anything we do with this patient uh, at any time in the future. So the next morning, just a few hours later, the patient goes to the neuro-ophthalmology office. Her visual acuity has declined a few lines from 2020 to 2040. Her color plates have declined slightly from 8 out of 8 to 7.5 out of 8 and slower. She notices a now a 60% red desaturation. Um, Dr. Thornton, what are you thinking now for her? This is before she was treated with steroids, is that right? Right. Okay. I think that she might need steroids now, but <laughs> I mean, we could consider, usually if they're getting steroids and they're worsening at that point, we could consider doing a lumbar puncture, um, but she hasn't been treated yet, so I would start there. Um, so before she gets admitted for IV steroids, she undergoes some other testing in neuro. You can see here, this is her right eye. Her fields were well done. Um, there are some scattered points of decreased sensitivity here in the right eye that don't really fit a known anatomic pattern. Dr. Sergat, do you make anything of these, this? Uh, no, this is a typical first field. Um, this is her left eye, the involved eye. The long, you can see here there's a very long testing time, six minutes. Um, so this is mostly artifact and we opted for a Goldman. Dr. Thornton, could you interpret this uh, Goldman field for us? Um, it looks like there is a defect that's um, denser, superiorly and nasally there, um, but she has good temporal um, peripheral vision. And here is her OCT. We already saw the multicolors from this day, but you can see here there's clearly um, edema in the in the left. Uh, Sarah, one of the important things here, though, is the mm -hmm. asymptomatic eye mm -hmm. has a significant loss in the temporal quadrant and papillomacular bundle, implying that she may have had um, some subclinical disease on the other side. And you can see how thick her nerve fiber layer is. And beneath the nerve fiber layer, there's also edema as well. Here's the retinal ganglion cell layer isolated. Dr. Sergat, what do you think of well, both again, of these sides? This is, this is more normal here. There's fluid right in this area. But again, the retinal ganglion cell layer is decreased in the clinically unaffected eye. Uh, and this is a significant global decrease. So she's had disease in the other eye. Uh, that's why I was asking Adam about the, those other diffusion-weighted images. Now, you know, years ago we would have said, oh, this is MS because she's had subclinical disease in the other eye. They would do a VEP and there'd be a delay in latency. Uh, but MS usually doesn't have this degree of optic disc edema. It may have some mild edema, but not what we see here. At this point um, in the office, proptosis was also noted clinically, and the MRI was re-reviewed, and there was um, clearly orbital fat involvement. That actually hadn't been commented on, really, in the first read. Um, so as Dr. Thornton already mentioned, due to the decreased visual acuity, the field loss, um, the patient was admitted for IV methylprednisolone. Inpatient, uh, going through her vision and her color plates and her pain, you can see she improves every day, 2025, and full color plates on day two. Same on day three. On day two, an LP was performed. Here we have her OCTs from day one and day two. She still has edema, but there's clearly improvement here. I'll move to the multicolor. Dr. Sergat, could you describe these yeah. for us? While the retinal nerve fiber layer improvement is mild, the multicolor improvement is very dramatic. Uh, we still don't have a central cup here, but you can see where the edema was. This is what uh, Ed Norton and Joel Glazer used to call a high water mark. Uh, and you can see where the edema extended to here and now it's regressed uh, 
Also, notice the retinal vascular changes uh, have disappeared. See how much different the retinal inferior temporal retinal vein is here than it was up in here with these very unusual dilated areas, uh, which we're still not quite certain of the pathophysiology of that. So I think in summary, she has acute disease in one side, subclinical disease on the other. And, and Adam, do you see uh, uh, orbit, the orbital fat findings? Is that part of MOG? <clears throat> uh, according to the literature, yes, it is. And that's, that's the thing that I think, at least uh, from an imaging standpoint, makes this kind of unusual. Because you know, typically, we don't see that with uh, optic neuritis. Or even NMO. Yeah, or the proptosis. Yeah. So, and with MOG, there's been a, lots of comments about how pain is a big part of this. And I think this case brings up the possibility, is the pain actually from orbital involvement, not just perineural involvement? Here's a case report from our own Dr. Wu, Dr. Dunn, and Dr. Surgat a case of papillitis with retinal venous congestion and intraocular inflammation. This patient had dermatomyositis, and um, it was noted that optic disc edema with retinal venous stasis, as Dr. Sergat just mentioned, has been re previously reported as a primary inflammatory optic neuropathy with secondary disruption of the retinal venous outflow. So our patient was discharged on oral prednisone, 60 milligrams after her three days of pulse. Um, and the remainder of her labs were pending at this time. At her two-week follow-up, we finally get some results here. So you can see her anti-MOG is positive, her IgG and IgG4 is positive, and her ACE is positive. The remainder of her labs were all normal, and then her CSF was also positive for anti-MOG. Dr. Penny, does this look like IgG4 disease to you? I mean, IgG4 disease certainly can vary a lot, um, but that wouldn't be something that I would think of as being IgG4. But mm -hmm. you know, I when people have inflamed optic nerves, I tend to not, they don't migrate to the oculoplastics clinic so much. <laughs> We're going to change that. <laughs> um, the, the borders are open for migration to plastics. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> So at this point, our question is, does this patient have one disease or two? Does she have anti-MOG? Does she have IgG4? Or does she have both? Dr. Thornton, do you have any thoughts on this question? So I certainly think that a lot of this is consistent with her anti-MOG um, disease. That's a fairly high titer. And in the setting of her optic neuritis and perineuritis, that's pretty convincing. Um, as Dr. Flanders was mentioning, you can have involvement of the orbital fat as well. Um, the IgG4 testing is elevated. The positivity of that is not very specific, but it does seem to be like even two or three times the upper limit of normal, um, which does increase the specificity there. So it's still unclear. Dr. Polita? You know, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein is an incredible antigen. And, um, you inject it into monkeys, and it's been done, and that's why I know about this. Um, the amount of antigenic spread is huge. So um, the fact that there's other things that are positive, I would say are probably secondary to, to the MOG. Um, so in terms of her clinical course, um, her labs were repeated. The ACE normalized, and she did have a CT chest that was normal. The anti-MOG and the IgG4 remained positive. She was um, continued on a very slow prednisone taper. At six weeks, um, still in her taper, she has no APD anymore. Her visual uh, acuity has returned to 20-25 in both eyes. Her color plates are full and brisk. She notes no more red desaturation. And here we have the multicolors from day one and week six. We see essentially normalization, though still some of this watermark here. And again, day one and day six. Dr. Sergat, what do you think of the uh, she's, thinning uh, here temporally? She's returned to normal here. Uh, probably over time, this area uh, in yellow will probably progress to some more 
retinal nerve fiber layer axonal loss. Her fields were repeated. Uh, the second field here at week six was very well performed and has essentially normalized. So this paper by John Chen, Object Neuritis in the Era of Biomarkers, discusses NMO spectrum disease and antimog IgG disease. So antimog is an antibody to myelin-associated glycoprotein in the cellular membrane. It leads to demyelinating optic neuritis and CNS lesions. Usually there's an excellent response to corticosteroids, but not always, and if there's no steroid response, the patient should move quickly to PLEX. Um, I just screenshotted this specific portion of the paper um, for our discussion. You can see here the optic nerve enhancement in MOG-positive optic neuritis involves longer segments than in MS, as we've discussed. It involves optic nerve sheath, a, i.e. perineural enhancement, as we discussed, and this sometimes extends to the surrounding orbital tissue. This chart, which is from the same paper, compares here in the first column multiple sclerosis optic neuritis, NMO optic neuritis, and MOG positive optic neuritis. I've highlighted a couple of the things that we've already discussed. You can see in MOG positive optic neuritis, bilateral optic neuritis is frequent um, compared to multiple sclerosis optic neuritis is sometimes. The visual outcome for MOG and multiple sclerosis are both good, and as Dr. Sergat already mentioned, the vasculitic component of NMO leads to very poor outcome typically. And the final portion I've highlighted here from the MRI findings is that the optic nerve enhancement is long and often includes perineural enhancement in MOG positive optic neuritis, uh, while in typical optic neuritis it is short. This paper is from the same authors. It simply describes the clinical phenotype, the radiologic features, and the treatment of MOG optic neuritis. I'll just highlight the key points here from their paper is that MOG has a higher likelihood of being recurrent, bilateral, associated with prominent disc edema, like Dr. Sergat mentioned, and have perineural enhancement around the nerve on MRI than demyelinating optic neuritis from MS. It is typically severe um, in terms of vision loss at its worst, although our patient was 20-20 um, at our initial presentation, and recovery is quite good. On the right here, we have just a treatment algorithm for MOG optic neuritis. Um, the patient should be pulsed for three to five days, as our patient was, and then followed by a very slow prednisone taper. And um, as we already discussed, if there's severe um, disease or there's no significant improvement, um, the patient should be considered for plasma exchange. If there's a single attack and full recovery, the patient can be observed without medications, but if there are recurrent attacks, if the patient is steroid dependent, if there's incomplete recovery, they should be considered for chronic immunotherapy. To move on to IgG4 discussion a little bit, um, the paper on the left here is a review of IgG4 generally. It is an elevation of IgG4 bearing plasma sites, leads to fi fibrosis in various organs, specifically relevant to ophthalmology, in the lacrimal glands as well as in the orbit. It can lead to myositis, perineural enhancement of both the or perineural fibrosis of the optic nerve and the trigeminal nerve, as well as just nonspecific orbital inflammation. It is quite steroid responsive. And then the paper on the right here discusses not IgG4 specifically, but optic perineuritis and its association with other autoimmune diseases. Typically presents with eye pain, vision loss, field defects, and disc edema, so it's quite similar to optic neuritis, though they are quite distinct entities. Findings that are unique to optic perineuritis include ptosis, diplopia, and exophthalmos. You can see in this chart from the paper here that um, of the 44 patients, 33 had associations with some sort of connective tissue disease, the most common being Graves, and the second most common, common being IgG4. So our patient update, she's currently at month six. She's not on any steroids anymore. Her visual acuity has remained intact, as well as her color plates. She has no pain. Her IgG4 is still elevated, um, and we see here her um, OCT from the most recent follow-up. Uh, so in summary, this was a 20-year-old female who presented with optic neuritis and perineuritis and some orbital inflammation. Her serum and her CSF were positive for anti-MOG antibodies. Her serum was positive for IgG4 antibodies. She was treated with three days of IV steroids with resolution of her edema, her pain, and her field deficits. She was continued on a very slow three-month prednisone taper, and she, shows, she so, shows no signs of relapse at this time, six months since her initial presentation. So we couldn't find another case where IgG4 and anti-MOG coexisted, 
And we, our question here, it remains, are there epitopes that are shared by MOG and IgG4? Um, how often would they um, do serologic studies for IgG4? But they really haven't been done. Uh, it's, uh, as um, was said earlier, um, the assumption has been, oh, this is just inflammation that extends from the uh, perineural space. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, the dura is pretty tough stuff. It doesn't leak a whole lot into the orbit with any other type of perineural enhancement. And uh, the pain is such a big, prominent finding with these patients. I think it merits uh, much more further investigation to see if they have multiple antibodies uh, running around here. And we should review our cases uh, with Adam and the varsity team not the JV team, <laughs> uh, to see if we look at our MOG patients, there is some maybe orbital findings that have been, you know, as soon as you see that optic nerve enhance, uh, people stop looking at orbital fat. I know I usually do. You know. And um, as a group in patients that have been previously characterized with MOG, have you seen in the literature anything to suggest systemic findings of IgG4-related disease? Uh, not systemic, but in MOG, you can have patients who do have other uh, neurological findings, and they can uh, be quite difficult. Uh, there will be a, a controlled, prospective uh, clinical trial beginning uh, with uh, be MOGAD is now the word, M-O-G-A-D, uh, and I know the planning stages for that are underway now. Uh, I'm not sure of what uh, agent will be used uh, for the treatment. Uh, well, I'm sure, but I can't tell you, but that's all right. Uh, anyway, uh, there will be a controlled clinical trial now on anti-MOG uh, disease. Bob, what's the natural history of uh, MOG with, without steroid treatment? And then if you need steroids, how quickly do you need them? Well, Without steroids is not really known, Chris. We usually see this and we treat because the patients have a lot of disc edema, pain, and often decreased vision. Uh, I've seen a couple of patients like this one who, when they came in, they were 20-20. We saw them in the clinic. They were 20-20 again. They came back a week later. They're counting fingers, and the steroids didn't work, but fortunately, they got better with phoresis. So, I, I think you have to treat this. Uh, you know, the problem is, is both the NMO and the anti-MOG antibodies are best done at Mayo, and those results take 10 days to two weeks to come back. So you've got to treat uh, empirically, and we now have a very good relationship with the uh, uh, phoresis service at Jefferson that uh, they will go ahead and phoresis, you know, if the patients have not improved with their vision without return of the antibody testing. This is a time-sensitive situation. Uh, most of the MOG, Chris, will be self-limited. Uh, I have two or three patients out of about 40 or 50 who do have recurrent disease and have had some other CNS findings. But by and large, it's more benign than NMO, and that's because of uh, where the Ig, uh, the aquaporin-4 antibodies are localized at the astrocytic foot plate versus the myelin-associated glycoprotein antibodies in their localization. Uh, but still, you can have cases that uh, get uh, very recurrent and very neurologically threatening. So this last slide is just an, uh, a graphic from this paper. Um, discussing a new spectrum of inflammatory demyelinating CNS lesions. So you can see here, there's the you know clinical suggestions of a demyelinating de uh, CNS disease. We have CSF findings, we have MRI findings, and then we have all these various um, potential entities. They included a purple question mark. So perhaps this is where our patient falls. So the the other thing is that in peripheral blood, uh, the NMO titers are more reliable than in CSF. So it, it, we don't want to start just saying, well, we're going to do the LP because we'll get the NMO titer there. Now, the peripheral blood titers are more uh, accurate and sensitive than CSF titers, which makes sense when you think about where the uh, antibody-mediated reaction is in the, in the central nervous system and retina. Um, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Serga, Dr. Gervasio, Dr. Thornton, and Reggie for helping me put this presentation together. And thanks, Dr. Flanders, for coming and sending me the MRI cuts.